aquatic communities in agricultural wetlands are being established after these wetlands are being restored. And I am out at the University of Waterloo, so I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Atawandaron nations, and our study sites are as well. And we're also neighbors to the Haldeman Tract, which is currently having a land dispute with developers. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please visit their Twitter address there. I'd also like to acknowledge my fantastic team um, at the University of Waterloo here is Rebecca Rooney and my research assistant Daniel McIsaac and the great people at Ducks on the Minute Canada, Dale, David and Jim, who have all contributed contributed substantially to this project. So wetlands perform a variety of ecosystem services. Some of the ones I'll be talking about today include water quality improvement, habitat, but have many, many benefits to um, the landscape and to landowners and communities as well. However, in southern Ontario especially, these wetlands are being lost. So this is a map of the 1800s and all the blue regions and counties you see are where there were high densities of wetlands. But as we move on to 2002, we see that there's been a dramatic loss of wetlands due to agriculture and urban development. You see very few blue regions with high densities. They're all very low densities. And to kind of offset this loss, the Ontario government has pledged to halt wetland loss by 2030. I don't know if this strategy is currently um, underway or if it's changed a little bit. Um, but the strategy originally was to conserve, create, and restore wetlands. And these really help to maintain species diversity where it's being lost and to promote connectivity among habitats. So the more habitats you see in the landscape, the easier um, species like waterfowl are going to be able to move between those habitats to access resources. And just this week, some great news. Um, Ontario is continuing partnering with Ducks Unlimited to provide funding to help create and restore more wetlands. So we're, we're still moving forward on this. And many of you probably know a lot about creation and restoration of wetlands. So the creation is converting um, possibly wet but depressed areas into a wetland. And in terms of Ducks Unlimited's um, ways of doing this, it's excavating areas that might be wet um, and creating a whole new system, a whole new wetland out of out of this land. In terms of restoration, it's returning a wetland to a previous condition. Um, for Ducks Unlimited, this might mean that there's been some sort of water or wetland vegetation in the area, but they excavate it and restore that wetland to a previous function. And for creating and restoring wetlands, obviously we need the land to do that on. Uh, so that's where landowners come in. They are very keen um, in conservation issues. A lot of them have created or restored wetlands on their properties. And we're looking to really engage with these landowners. Jen McCallum, she did her master's in Southern Ontario, and she looked at what motivates landowners to conserve wetlands. And some of the ideas that popped up um, was to connect to nature, whether it's through plants and wildlife, whether these landowners like to fish and hunt on their properties, whether the wetlands provide some benefit for their farming activities. They have an attachment to their property, so they want to see it thrive and do really well. There might be a social context where communities or neighbors or family members encourage and influence landowners to develop these wetlands. And it might have some sort of personal benefit. Maybe it makes the property more beautiful, gives an opportunity for recreation, and some more ideas like that. And having these wetlands and agricultural landscapes really benefits that landscape in a number of ways, many of which people at Ducks Unlimited have already researched. Um, so controlling soil erosion, mitigating flood risk, as you can imagine in these more bare open areas like on crop um, for cropland, there's probably going to be more soil erosion. So this can really help agricultural landscapes. 
These wetlands give an opportunity for wildlife refuges in agricultural landscapes, so they're a bit more naturalized. Um, they may give resources to a variety of wildlife, and they also retain nutrients, and that's great to remove those nutrients from the landscape before they enter waterways. On the flip side, there might be some agrochemical contamination from all these pesticides or other chemicals aggregating in these wetlands. And so as time goes on, we'd like to estimate the success of the wetland, see how well they're doing after they're restored or created. And you can do this by looking at the vegetation community, seeing what the water, how well the water levels are retained, seeing how it has elapsed, and looking at the function of the wetland. So that might be nutrient cycling, energy flow, um, what kind of plant life is being produced, what kind of interactions different kinds of species have. And one aspect of this is looking at wildlife and seeing how many trophic levels we have, what kind of interactions we have among species. So for our project, we looked at focally aquatic invertebrates. So these can be aquatic where they live their whole life cycle in the water, or they can be semi-aquatic where they come out of the water at some point of their life history stage and use the terrestrial environment. They are indicators of aquatic ecosystem health, so you might see some rare taxa that have very specific habitat requirements, and that might show us that we have a really healthy wetland. If those species aren't there, maybe the wetland isn't as healthy yet. And these invertebrates provide a key resource for both aquatic and terrestrial consumers. So as you can imagine, if you are a waterfowl flying through the landscape, you're going to look for the high density of prey items at a wetland. So this led to our research question of first establishing whether pesticides are retained in these agricultural wetlands, and second, whether they affect what communities are present. So what combinations of species of these invertebrates we find in wetlands. We did our study in Southern Ontario, just south of Toronto, so in Welland, Lincoln, and Haldeman counties. And we chose our wetland sites by having a standardized approach, only looking at open water wetlands, 28 of them that were all made in clay soil, created five to 10 years ago. So there are very similar levels of wetland succession um, and they varied in size. And as you can see in the background photos, which were all photos of the wetlands we looked at, um, there's quite a variation in surrounding land cover around the wetlands. So some sites had more natural forests, some had substantial cropland, grassland, or pastures. And some of these croplands and pastures included wheat, corn, soybeans, and, pa and pasture. Um, there is crop rotation occurring in this region, so from year to year you might have different types of crops, and as you can imagine that would lead to different pesticides or different chemicals um, being used to spray or treat these seeds or plants. Um, as you can see in the dark red in this map, Haldeman County has a very large number of soybean farms. Uh, so as you can imagine, those farms do dominated what our sites had in terms of crop cover. Um, so all of them were soybeans. And with soybeans come 14 associated herbicides that are either present when spraying or when the seed is planted and that seed is treated. So we looked at what kind of communities we could find in these wetlands. Firstly, we looked at those aquatic and semi-aquatic invertebrates, so the wildlife without a backbone. Um, and we looked at the water column, we looked in the vegetation, and we looked in the sediment. And as you can see in the middle picture here, we also set up emergence traps, and those emergence traps let us catch any insects that come out of the water. So once they've completed their larval stage in the water, they come out and we're able to see, okay, the conditions are good here. We haven't seen any impact on them being able to become adults. And lastly, we looked at fish populations. I'm not expecting really to see anything because these are very isolated wetlands, um, but they do have extreme pressures on invertebrate presence because they are they consume invertebrates. And we also looked at the water column quality. 
Um, so pesticide content, nutrients, and some more physical parameters like temperature, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity. All right, so to get to our question of how these wetland communities are affected by agricultural landscapes. Firstly, we found a great diversity of wildlife in these wetlands. Some invertebrate examples include freshwater mussels, snails, mites, shrimp, dragonflies. Uh, we also found some really cool vertebrates that we didn't quantify, but we found some garter snakes, quite a few bird species, including red-winged blackbird, common snapping turtles, and a variety of frogs, such as green frogs. The most exciting result is that we found fish in 89% of the wetlands, even though they were so isolated. So most of the wetlands were dominated by pumpkin seed, but we did see quite a few minnow species and stickleback. Um, and a lot of these are warm water fish, but they do have varying habitat requirements. We weren't able to find a good predictor of fish diversity, so we compared wetland size to fish diversity, and we haven't found anything, um, no relation between the two. And we also thought maybe the proximity of the wetland to a local stream might be allowing these fish to come in, and that didn't seem to be the case either. Um, so we kind of delved into the literature, the scientific literature, and found this recent article. Apparently, there's a bit of, of debate about how these fish get into isolated systems, but fish eggs can actually be ingested by waterfowl, and when the waterfowl will poop them out, they can survive and develop into larvae. Um, so that's one way that these waterfowl could be introducing fish to these very isolated systems, which has really interesting implications for the food web. While we didn't really find good predictors of fish diversity, we looked at what kind of surrounding land cover there was around these wetlands and what kind of fish species were associated with those. Um, so there seemed to be an interesting pattern with the central mud minnow appearing in wetlands that had more forest or crop cover around them and the golden shiner appearing with more shrubland and bare soil around the wetlands. So we're not really sure how to explain this yet. Maybe it kind of goes along with the bird hypothesis where maybe there are birds that visit these two distinct land cover types. Um, I also went out with Jeff Crete from Ducks Unlimited earlier in the season, and we saw some, these fish are dead, <laughs> but we did see some minnows moving across the bare soil in a field with very minimal standing water. And they were able to kind of move across the, the land, which was really interesting. So I'm not sure if there's something more to pursue in that or not, or if it was just kind of a random effect. In terms of pesticides, we only found pesticides in 36% of the wetlands, which was very interesting. And they were a mix of herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. The most interesting insecticide that we saw was remnants of DDT, which is a little bit terrifying, um, but they were historical remnants that were breaking down. Uh, and this would have occurred with spraying occurring in the 1970s when there was no wetland, that DDT going into the sediment and being broken down. Um, and so now we see just the remnant um, concentrations today. And there have been some interesting studies in the Niagara region specifically. Um, so this graph is a little bit small and hard to see, but um, as you go deeper into the soil in the Niagara region, you can see different concentrations of DDE, which is a breakdown component of DDT. So there is some historical spraying that's happened and we are seeing these remnant um, insecticides in the soil. So these results are still a bit preliminary because I'm going through identifying all the invertebrates, but in terms of number of species found so far, the number doesn't seem to be affected by whether we detected pesticides in the wetlands on the right or whether we didn't detect those pesticides. So the number of species seems to be pretty equivalent. And this might change the more um, types of samples we go through. So right now this is mostly focused on what we found in the water column, but this might change depending on what we see in the vegetation. In terms of comparing the local environment to number of species, the environment kind of broke down into two components. So we have this component on the left that was associated, 
sorry, <laughs> associated with higher temperatures and greater dissolved oxygen. And then we have these wetlands on the right that were associated with greater canopy cover, so overhanging shading or tree cover, and greater connectivity, which was kind of a um, representative of how silty these wetlands were. And doing a multivariate analysis or redundancy analysis, we found that richness, so number of species actually increased when there were lower temperatures and greater canopy. Um, and greater conductivity as well. So mostly on this right side, where it was the opposite of the higher temperature. So we're seeing diversity so far more in cooler temperature wetlands. So it feels like we still have a lot of work to do, even though <laughs> I'm kind of two years into this project, um, but we still have a lot of invertebrates to ID um, within, across the wetland spatially and across time. So during different seasons, we have data on nutrient levels, uh, wetland vegetation composition. So that may influence um, the microhabitats for fish species and possibly for the invertebrates as well. And this information on surrounding land cover. And our research assistant, Danny McIsaac, also conducted a smaller study on ant and, beetles commu ant and beetle communities around the wetlands. So they do use um, soil moisture to varying degrees, and this is really beneficial. So these wetlands actually help to promote ant and beetle communities. And we're finding that the ants and beetles don't really see these lands or this wetland perimeter as disturbed at all, even though it's excavated. There's quite a bit of diversity. So these wetlands continue to be an opportunity for both aquatic and terrestrial species. So to wrap up, wetlands have low pesticide levels, which is great. Um, they're, they're supporting aquatic communities to varying degrees. So we're seeing these larval invertebrates completing their life cycle, being able to emerge if they're insects. We're seeing diverse fish species. And we feel that this will really help offset wetland loss in, in Southern Ontario and help to promote diversity. And even if these aren't on par to natural wetlands, you're going to have these hotspots for diversity that um, animals can move between like the more natural areas and these agricultural wetlands. Using invertebrates was really interesting because they can reflect change in aquatic and terrestrial systems and the interaction between the two. So if we're seeing that invertebrates kind of drop off in these wetlands, we can look at the surrounding terrestrial conditions and see what's going on and vice versa. And there's also the potential, depending on how our results play out, that there's this interaction between land use and climate change. So with climate change, everything's getting potentially a bit drier, potentially a bit hotter. Um, these wetlands, the water levels might not persist, or they may get too warm for some species to thrive in. Um, maybe there's some possibility to change the surrounding land cover and add, add some more trees along the perimeter, create a little riparian zone so that the wetlands can stay cool and allow um, some of these more heat sensitive taxa to thrive in. Um, some future opportunities. I'm really excited with the data and the opportunity to work with all these groups of people. Um, the landowners in particular have been great in sharing information and they really seem to want to engage with some of the science. Um, so we're looking into opportunities with the communications team at Ducks Unlimited Berry um, to see how we can present the data to landowners and what opportunities might be there to engage with the landowners to kind of connect them more to the science, maybe giving them some more real-time data as opposed to my um, two years it takes to get some identifying of some of the wildlife that's in their wetlands. Um, there's also an opportunity to do some more long-term monitoring, seeing how these communities are changing over time and under different environmental conditions. And when we're selecting, um, a landscape or an area for to create or restore these wetlands, it might be helpful to find microhabitats, so smaller habitats or larger habitats that aren't going to experience those extreme heats or extreme drought. So there might be an opportunity to kind of figure out where those are 
to better connect the wetlands and to better um, find some more refuges for some of these wildlife. So I'd like to thank all my partners um, and my funding agencies, as well as members of the Rooney Lab and all the local land landowners for sharing their knowledge with me. And I'm open to any questions or discussion. Thanks so much. And feel free to contact me at any time if you have any further questions. Thanks, Sarah. We have about five minutes for questions or so. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them into the chat box and I will uh, read them off to Sarah. Uh, we do have a uh, first question from Jim DeVries. Uh, Jim asks Sarah, <laughs> have you examined invert abundance as opposed to diversity relative to covariates like pesticides, fish, etc.? Um, yeah, we're still, I haven't analyzed those results yet, but we do have species abundances. We just kind of have to standardize those abundances across um, different processing methods that we used. Um, but yes, those will definitely be looked at. Okay, we have a question from Pascal Badiou. Did you measure DOC concentrations in your wetlands? Is high DOC potentially an explanation for why you did not detect pesticides at significant levels in the majority of wetlands? That's a great question. Uh, we didn't look at uh, dissolved organic carbon, but um, that could very well be, be in an interesting thing to look at in the future. From just looking at your wetlands, did would, would you be able to tell if they do you have a diversity of DOC concentrations? Maybe some have more tile drainage than others, Sarah, or is that? Um, none of them had tile drainage, but I'm not well, too sure what the variety would be. Do you find that that's pretty, is that is that normal for that area of, of Ontario or no? It is, yeah, um, because it's more clay-based. Um, I'm not sure why, but in more southwestern Ontario, we see a lot of tile drainage, but there isn't as much tile, or there is no tile drainage out here. Well, interesting. Okay. Uh, Catherine Brown has a question. Is there an opportunity to employ citizen science activities as a tool to engage landowners? Yes, for sure. I think that would be very interesting. Um, yeah, I think a them already do their own work so it'd be very interesting to have more collaborative approach a lot of them go out and look at what dragonflies are flying around or monitor what birds are in their nest boxes um, a few look at the fish every once in a while too so i think that's definitely a good way to get them engaged with their wetland and maybe create some sort of community of engaged landowners where they can share their findings with each other yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I run a project in southwestern Ontario, and that's one thing those landowners in that area, they, they definitely love their wetlands. That's without yeah. a doubt. <clears throat> okay, well, we're ending the end of the half hour here, so we'll, uh, we'll thank Sarah for her presentation, and we'll just take a couple of minutes here, and we'll switch over to Matt. Okay, thank you, everybody. Brian, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yeah, let's uh you want to go ahead and share your screen there and we'll 